welcome to this very special edition of Talks At, which is delivered in partnership with Juglers for Jewish Heritage Month. My name is Maya Raison, and I am thrilled to be joined by Hani Affelbaum, a food writer, photographer, mother of five, and cookbook author. You might know her from her beautiful blog, Busy in Brooklyn, or her newest book, Totally Kosher, which we're going to chat about today. This cookbook has all kinds of kosher recipes, modern takes on traditional foods, recipes inspired by her worldwide travels, and some classic old-time favorites as well. Hani is bringing kosher to the mainstream world, and all I have to say is anyone who has a recipe called bougie tuna bagel, putting the word bougie and bagel into the same sentence is obviously going to be my new best friend. So before we get started, a quick reminder that after Hani and I chat, we're going to open things up to Q&A. So please add your questions to the chat. And for now, please join me in welcoming Hani. Hey, guys. My daughter actually made the bougie tuna bagels for lunch today. So okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> no, she Literally, did. I saw that and I was like, I love Hani because who can use the word bougie in a kosher cookbook. Um, I also love alliteration. So <laughs> yeah, I noticed, <laughs> I noticed from your busy in Brooklyn blog, which I was like, let me try to say this. It is a little mouthful, but it is a beautiful blog. Um, so nice to meet you. I am so glad you were able to join us and all of our listeners are here as well. Um, I thought perhaps since it is Jewish Heritage Month, that it might be nice to get started with you sharing a little bit about your Jewish heritage with us. Of course. Uh, well, I um, uh, I grew up Ashkenazi. Um, that means my family comes from Eastern Europe uh, on both sides, both my parents. And um, my dad grew up in Israel um, and then uh, came to uh, came to Brooklyn as a teenager and married my mom. And I grew up here in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, uh, lived here my whole life, still live here around the corner from my childhood home. And I grew up in as part of the Chabad Lubavitch movement and 770 Eastern Parkway, which is the Grand Synagogue. Um, is literally around the corner from my home. And I grew up in a very open home. My mother always had hundreds of guests coming through our doors, lavish meals. She served like real traditional Ashkenazi Jewish cuisine, lots of kugel, brisket, uh, gefilte fish, uh, stuffed cabbage, you know, all the Jewish foods that you could think of. And uh, none of which I cook now because I'm always putting my modern spin on everything. So I love yeah. that. And I know we had just a quick second to chat before we started, and you shared that you have some special plans coming up for some friends to come over. And I love the story so much. I thought you might share as I thought it really captured your kind of fresh take on kosher. So yeah, so I have cooking and my, my kitchen smells amazing because I just made some uh, Mexican tamales with barbacoa beef. Um, and I love, as much as I love, you know, putting my own spin on things, and that's really my thing. The first time I made tamales, I actually did a kishka tamale stuffed with pastrami because that's you know I like to Jewify everything but there's something nice about learning to do something the real authentic way um so you know I, I was there for the challenge because I'm having a dumpling party with a bunch of my foodie friends and everyone's making a different dumpling from around the world um so I chose tamales because I love a good project and getting into it and having fun with it and it was so it's very laborious but was very fun to me I love that and I'm pretty sure did you just say Jewify? Yes. I did. Okay. That is now my <laughs> new favorite word as well. Okay. <laughs> just checking, just making sure. Um, we're adding that to the urban slang dictionary as we speak. Um, so another question for you has to do with what struck me immediately when I started looking through your book um, was the absolute beauty in not just the food photography, but the composition, the fonts, everything. Uh, and I would love to hear you share some about your creativity and where you find inspiration. So I actually, uh, you know, before I was a blogger, I actually was a web designer. So I, you know, I've always had, you know, a, a passion for composition and styling. Um, and I've always been artistic. And I, you know, I love that I found the perfect medium for me to kind of express myself creatively on so many different levels, being a food photographer and being able to 
you know, help style my book and, you know, actually have an opinion about all the graphics and the styling and the fonts and, you know, everything. Um, and I'm very opinionated about it and I want it to be perfect. I am a perfectionist. Um, so it helps that I'm able to be the photographer because I'm ac actually able to execute my vision exactly the way that I want, want it. Um, and yeah, I'm so proud of how the book came out. Like the, like you said, the photos are just, for me, it's about like color and everyone, you know, the joke about Jewish food is that it's all Brown, right? Like we mentioned all the different Jewish foods at the beginning and there really are all Brown foods. And like, whenever I give like cooking workshops, demonstrations, I love to start with a Brown ingredient and show people how I bring color to it. Like my jeweled hummus or my eggplant carpaccio, like roasted eggplant, it's just Brown. And jeweled and hummus is brown. Like, how do we make it like pop and wow? And you know, for me, part of building a recipe is about so much. You know, people eat with their eyes first. So presentation, obviously, flavor comes first, but color, presentation, and really, uh, you know, bringing all that together brings life to a dish that otherwise might just look bland. So that's really important to me, and I think the book is a good expression of that. It is a beautiful expression. My father-in-law was a Kasher, a kosher caterer. Okay. Um, and I have the same assumption about everything being brown. If it's right. coming from a kosher catering, yes. I won't tell Papa that. Um, but I think in your book, I mean, even just the boards, the beautiful boards and the colors that you bring out um, and the vibrancy, I just felt that vibrancy. And I felt this pride of like, yeah, kosher food is cool. Like it's, it's moving along with the times. I just feel exactly. like you captured that so beautifully and it felt so unique and different than other kosher cookbooks um, and other Jewish cooking books um, that I've read. So I'm curious, I've, I've been asked this question just because we try to not have pork in the house and we do not keep kosher. However, it confuses people. Yeah. And I've been asked, you know, a hundred times, just if I say I'm Jewish, like, oh, do you keep kosher? And anyway, so my question for you is, can you help clarify the difference between kosher food and Jewish food, which I know you do in your book as well. Yeah. So, you know, um, all kosher food is Jewish food, but not all Jewish food is kosher food. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are culturally Jewish and they, uh, you know, they enjoy like the Reuben sandwich, which if you break it apart is not a kosher sandwich because it has corned beef and it has Swiss cheese in the same sandwich. And one of the big no-nos in the kosher kitchen is mixing milk and meat together in the same meal, in the same dish. Um, so, you know, there are like a lot of deli foods and cats is the famous cats deli is completely not kosher. So, you know, a lot of the deli foods, uh, people assume that because they're Jewish, they're kosher, but that's not the case at all. Um, so there is a very big, you know, difference between kosher food and Jewish food. Whereas if someone keeps kosher, they're likely eating Jewish food. So yes, definitely a big difference. And you know, when it comes to kosher, there are so many different levels of observance. And I talk a little bit about the kosher rules. I mean, kosher is so complex that it would require its own book just to talk about all the different, you know, uh, rules. But really, I find like meeting people, a lot of people just assume like kosher means a rabbi came in, blessed your kitchen, or maybe you're eating a higher standard of food. It's not like that at all. There are a set of rules that people, and kosher actually means fit in Hebrew. Um, and uh, it's basically food that is fit for consumption by a, an observant Jew who chooses to keep the laws of kosher. And, you know, depending how you were raised, how you grew up, you know, there's different interpretations of that. And But at the bare minimum, most people would say, like, no pork, no shellfish, and no mixing milk and meat together in the same dish. And then from there, there are many other rules. Some people have two separate kitchens, like I do. I have a dairy and a meat kitchen. Um, some people even have, like, a pyro, which is neutral, not meat, not dairy. I mean, not separate kitchens, separate sides of the kitchen. So I have separate ovens, separate sinks, separate pots. Um, and I was raised that way. So for me, it's easy. Uh, it's not even something that I struggle with. It's just, you know, it comes natural to me. Uh, some people that, you know, decide to take on the rules of kosher. It's a lot of, of learning and a lot of things, you know, to get used to. But, um, you know, it's definitely one of those things that if you're raised with it, it's definitely easier than for those that choose to take it on. So. Yeah, I totally get that. I remember the first time I went to my husband's house that he grew up in his, um, you know, he grew up in a kosher house and I was like, what's it going to look like? Even though I have relatives that keep kosher, but I just, you know, I was yeah. worried I was going to put the forks in the wrong place and the this, but um, what I love about how you approach kosher cooking is just making it feel so much more accessible. Yeah. And I just felt like this book is for me and this blog is for me, even though I 
I'm not a kosher cook myself. Um, right. Although, as I mentioned um, to you before we got started, I did have my husband in the kitchen this morning making some gluten-free scones out of your recipe book, um, which are delicious. So um, next question for you. I know this is probably controversial, but let's talk kosher salt for a minute. Okay. Yes. Um, what is the best kosher salt? Morton's Diamonds, talk to me and why? Okay. So first of all, let's just say that kosher salt, all salt is kosher. Uh, unless it's like flavored with, you know, Merlot salt or some spe specialty item. Um, but in general, pure salt is all kosher. Doesn't even need, doesn't even require kosher certification. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that it's called kosher salt is because that's what's used in the koshering process of slaughtering meat in order to, and chicken and poultry to remove the blood. Any animal, uh, that's how we do it. Draw out the blood by salting it. That's why it's called kosher salt. Um, I am a diamond crystal kosher salt forever. <laughs> uh, yes, that is my favorite salt. And I, listen, for, I say for everyone, it's whatever you're, you get used to. I actually grew up, my mom always used diamond crystal kosher salt and she always left the box out on the counter and the bottom would get soggy and she would have to end up throwing it out. And I have my salt cellar on my island that I'm constantly refilling. Uh, I always tell people don't leave, don't, don't use the box, pour the box into a salt cellar. <laughs> also never pour salt from a box because you're, you end up pouring too much. Like you got to pinch it and feel it with your fingers. Okay. So I always say for everyone, it's like what you get used to because the salt that you're used to seasoning with, that's how you're able to easily flavor food. And I give workshops around the world. Sometimes I'll like literally pack salt with me because if I go to Europe and I ask for kosher salt, it is super coarse and it's so nothing like diamond crystal kosher salt. And I end up having to use sea salt, which I'm not used to flavoring with sea salt. And it's much more, uh, there's much more salt per teaspoon as opposed to kosher salt. So then you end up needing way less. So I just got used to diamond crystal. Um, in terms of more and diamond crystal, yeah, there, there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, so I prefer my diamond crystals, my one true love. <laughs> yes. I, I love it. Yes. Um, the other thing I noticed as you're kind of talking about your salt hacks is you have a section in your book called Top 10 kitchen hacks. Yes. Which as someone who identifies as a hack myself, I love that. Okay. Can you tell us another kitchen hack that you think we all should know about in addition to take the salt out of the box, which I love and have okay. never done? Two of my favorites, because I can't pick what, these are my top two favorites. Okay. We'll take And it. whenever I show this, like in a cooking class, everyone's like, whoa, mind blown. I'm a big food <laughs> processor user. Like I use it all the time, especially cooking for the holidays, Shabbat dinner every week. I'll make like one thing after another in my food processor. You're hosting a big meal, whatever it is. So before I put the lid on my food processor, I put a pizza, piece of saran wrap or parchment paper. And then you know how when, every, when, you, when you puree something in the food processor, it splashes like in all the crevices. So it keeps your lid completely clean because you're, it does everything splashes and hits the parchment paper. Brilliant. So I love that. But love don't, don't do that if you plan to pour something through the feeding tube. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, so that's number one. The second one that I love, love is chocolate chips in a Ziploc bag. So no need to melt anything in the microwave or have a double boiler. I put chocolate chips in a Ziploc. You wanna use a real Ziploc because we're putting it in hot water. Uh, put it in a little cup with boiling hot water. Put everything, consolidate all your chips into the corner. Put it in a, 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 a cup, mug, whatever, glass, mason jar. Let it sit there. Take it out after like a couple of minutes. Massage it. Put it back in. Melted chocolate chips in a piping bag. Snip the corner. Drizzle. Bro. Best, oh, best hack. That is brilliant. Yes. I am on it. Yes. Um, I will also add something that I read. I think it was in a different section, but... I was like, why didn't I think of this? Okay. It was that you said um, ice cube trays was something like one of your best things to have in the kitchen. It was like, make coffee ice cubes for I ice. I made them yesterday, literally. Yes. I was like, hello. How did I not think of this? Thank you, Hani. So like I said, I genuinely felt like this book is for me too, even though I'm not the most sophisticated chef. Um, and on that note, yes. if someone is new to kosher cooking, is there a section of the book or a recipe that you suggest they start with? Hmm. Well, for me, it's like the book just happens to be kosher. Like I have people that, are, that aren't even Jewish that buy my book, that follow my blog, follow me on Instagram. Absolutely. Right. So it's not necessarily, if you're, if you're new to, I mean, if you, I would say if you're new to cooking, let's say, because I don't know that anything in the recipe book that it has to do with being specifically kosher, right? 
Um, if you want to try something um, that would, okay, I have an, I have a one. Okay, so the Philly cheesesteak sandwich, right? You're new to kosher. You can't mix milk and meat together in the same dish, so you cannot have a Philly cheesesteak sandwich. So I made one with portobello mushrooms. Portobello mushrooms are really meaty, and um, it's absolutely delicious. So that would be a way if, let's say, you are becoming kosher and you now cannot have that. Yeah, that's one. And people have asked, I, I've been just as like a Jewish person, someone's like, my son's girlfriend is coming over yeah. and I want to make sure that I make something that yes. she can eat so I can be respectful and I'm going to host Hanukkah, even though, you know, I don't observe Hanukkah. Is there like a good dish or something that you think is, um, it doesn't have to be easy to make, but something okay. that kind of shows a nod to our heritage and tradition through cooking um, and through some of your creativity. So that's why I did a tradition chapter in the book. So if, you know, if you want to, and I do get that a lot. I meet a lot of people or they'll message me on Instagram and be like, I'm hosting a dinner. I'm having my son over and his girlfriend and I want to make something, you know, traditional. So I do get that a lot, which is why I incorporated, while I don't normally cook traditional food, I always say like, I'm the anti kogo Like why take, a beautiful vegetable, <laughs> boil out all the flavor, mash it up, add eggs and oil and put it in the oven when you could just roast it with olive oil and salt and yeah. pepper, right? So like, but at the same time, I love going over to my mom's house on a Friday afternoon and having like a piping hot piece of potato cocoa. Like there is nothing better. It's such comfort food to me. So like, I get that and I get that there's a place for it. And like chicken soup, matzo ball soup on Friday night, like you know, there's really like, it's, it's a hug from your bubby, you know? Yeah. So, um, I definitely like, I appreciate that. And that's why I did, you know, the, that the tradition chapter. So, you know, in there you'll find like matzo ball soup and my mom, mom's perfect potato kugel. Um, so yeah, recipes like that. If you wanted to do something really traditional, uh, there's gefilte fish from scratch, there's chalent, uh, you know, all those kind of uh, stuffed cabbage, yeah, okay. which is, yeah. yeah, which is a project, but mm -hmm. stuffed cabbage is delicious. So, oh my goodness. My aunt, when I was visiting her in Israel was making gefilte fish from scratch. And yeah. I was like, how many days and hours are we going to wait? And the smell is a situation. So <laughs> that is for the hearty chefs among us. Yes. Um, but thank you for, I love those suggestions. I have many more questions, which I'm going to continue asking and yes. I'm going to cue all of the amazing listeners tuning in to add your questions for Q&A, which will be coming soon. Um, so one thing that I also loved about the way and love about the way you approach um, kosher cooking and just cooking in general is the inspiration that you find from other parts of the world and from your travels. And I know on your blog, you had a list of all of the, some of the amazing places that you've traveled, but I'm curious what your favorite place is to travel outside of the United States and how that's inspired your recipes. Oh gosh. <laughs> I'm like filled with wanderlust. So it's so hard to pick like a favorite because I love so many things about so many different countries. Um, I've been to like six countries just in the past year alone. So uh, I'm going back to Italy uh, in a month. Um, so really excited about that. And there's one of the hardest parts I would say for me as a chef, keeping kosher from everything. Like I recipes, I feel like in today's day and age, we can find almost all products. Obviously you can't, you know, you can't use bacon, but you can use beef bacon, right? There's very few things that are not available to you know, to us and like, there are so many kosher restaurants everywhere. Many nowadays are, you know, doing all different types of ethnic cuisine. So like, I don't feel like I'm missing out, but when I travel, that is a little bit difficult because part of travel is getting to know the culture of the place that you're traveling. And food is such a big part of that. And you obviously can't just like go have carbonara in, uh, <laughs> you know, because it has guanciale in it, you know? So the thing is in Rome, uh, in the Jewish ghetto, there's lots of amazing kosher restaurants. So um, that's amazing. And there's actually two um, really incredible wineries and farm to table restaurants in Tuscany, which I'm so excited to go back to when I'll be there. So, um, you know, we'll go travel hunting and bring travels back and make pasta from scratch and all that kosher. So it's, uh, it's really inc uh, incredible. But that's what's beautiful about Rome is that you have that possibility. And that's not available in every single country that you go to. So, um, you know, uh, I, I love Italy for that reason, because I, I can get gelato, I can get all the amazing coffees and, uh, and they make 
You know, the kosher carbonara in the restaurant won an award for the best carbonara in Italy. And it's kosher. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to tell us the name of the restaurant? Is this <laughs> um, like the, the best kept secret or the worst kept secret? We must know. Right. Okay. I have to remember the name of the restaurant. Okay. Yeah. okay. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Um, amazing. Um, I also love the yes. simplicity of some of the recipes, as mentioned. Not quite the master chef over here. Okay. Um, and we made the green beans. We, meaning my husband, made okay. the green beans as I asked him to. Okay. <laughs> Make some Very easy recipe. Yes. The easiest recipe. So delicious. So yes. my question, my my little personal, since I'm conducting the interview, I get to ask, is what is the easiest thing to make in your cookbook that looks the fanciest? Eggplant carpaccio. Okay. And um, I have a hack for you for that also. Oh, I will take it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. That was um, one of the things. Okay. So for the eggplant carpaccio, yeah. you're basically roasting eggplant and you're putting, you know, the flesh out on a platter and literally everything just gets drizzled on top beautifully. So it's like you can buy, you know, if you can buy already seeded pomegranate, just sprinkle okay. it on. Tahini comes straight raw from the jar. No, you don't even have to prep tahini sauce. Um, good quality olive oil, some chopped dates, parsley. And also you can totally change it up whatever you have in the house. You want to put some radishes on top. You want to put some jalapenos if you like it spicy. Uh, all those, you know, anything that you like. But uh, the hack is that Galil, an Israeli company, they sell a glass jar of already roasted eggplant flesh. Stop that it. is so smoky. They even have it at like Walmart. Stop it. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So seriously... No one will know that you didn't roast it yourself. Goes out on the platter. Everything gets drizzled on top. And everybody loses it because it's so beautiful and delicious. Oh, my gosh. That is yes. amazing. I <laughs> definitely love to be the person that doesn't really know how to cook that well, but brings yeah. the thing. And people are like, oh, my gosh, it looks amazing. And I'm like, oh, you know. Uh, so that's perfect. That is the best hack. And I... I'm going to have to fact check you on that. That is found at Walmart because that Walmart.com really has it. Okay. They have another website. I can promise that every Walmart okay. has it in the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's pretty amazing though. I love finding Israeli products. I actually worked in an olive factory in Israel. No I way. olives for literally months because the smell of olive juice, which had been poured on me yeah. from the line, the olive line, yeah. um, did sort of destroy my love of olives, but it's back. Don't oh, worry. No. Hey, she talk. But when I see <laughs> Uh, in the store i'm like all right i i i know you i know you that's know. awesome um yes cannot make that up and um yes it's built some good character <laughs> um okay another question for you yes you just want to whip something up for the kids like you know you have you have a, a house full of kids house full of family what are you just gonna whip up in my house refried bean tacos okay we always have canned beans in the in the pantry so easy to do. Like I always also keep like corn tortillas in the freezer. Um, if they're fresh, even better. Um, but like tacos are like the easiest thing and you just, whatever you have on hand, you know, you, you can kind of work with to whip up a quick salad or, you know, so my kids really love that. And it's so easy to do. Okay. I love yeah. that. I want something easy and I want to have easy ingredients that I don't have to like go to the store to get feed a bunch of hungry kids. Love it. I think, you know, being a mom, I really, I get the cooking fatigue. I get what it means to want to put dinner on the table really quickly. So really that's why my, my recipes are very approachable. I try not to do too many things that are very labor intensive uh, because I, I just, that, that's the type of cook I am like, just whip it out. You know, once in a while I want to do a project today. I made tamales. Yes. I enjoy it. But like on a day to day basis, I just want to get dinner on the table. And also I have in the book, um, you know, how I master dinner every day of the week. And I have this schedule that I, that I, you know, made that takes all the guesswork out of, you know, out of planning dinners, which is really great. Like, you know, every uh, Sunday is leftovers from Shabbat or it's like barbecue. Uh, Monday is always a meatless in my house, which I'm very passionate about that, especially, you know, being traditional and, and observing Shabbat every week, we eat a lot of animal protein over the weekend. So I think it's important to have that break on Mondays. Tuesdays is always meat. Wednesdays is always poultry. Thursdays is dairy. And then Friday night dinner is traditional Shabbat dinner. And then Saturday night is something with eggs. And that's it. So like, 
you know, comes like Wednesday morning, I know I got to take chicken out of the freezer and then I can play with it once it's time to make dinner. But like it, it, it takes like the whole of what should I make for dinner? And there's a million different things to make. So like, okay, I'm making chicken for dinner. What I'm making on the side, I'll figure it out as I go along. But like that really helped me, um, you know, with I, I see the routine and the regimen that you put in and that has to create some kind of simplification. And at the same time, as a working mom myself, I'm literally looking at Hani and I'm like, Hani, how are you doing this? I sometimes personally have found it offensive when, you know, I get asked the question, how do you do it? Like almost looking at me like I'm an alien that has managed to find a way to work and raise children at the same time. But I must say, um, looking at your body of work, all the amazing things that you're doing, your travel, um, I, I do wonder about how you do it. And for me, my favorite Jewish value is, um, you know, shalom bayit and keeping peace in the house. And I'm like, how, Pani, do you manage? And I say this in the most loving, least offensive way that I can, because I genuinely want to know, like, how, how do you manage all of these things and keep some degree of peace in your house? <laughs> Um, I think, first of all, it's approaching things, uh, you know, with the right attitude. Like I said, like I, you know, my, I grew up in a home, like every Friday afternoon was extremely stressful with my mom trying to, you know, make Shabbat and like, you know, so many things like, uh, you know, prepare the table, iron the, the shirts, make all the food, you know, all, all the different grocery shop, this or that. I like made a decision that when I raise my kids, our Friday afternoons are going to be chilled everything's gonna be ready we're gonna have it's just i have put music on like it's just really important to me to set the tone that also like you know when you raise children um with tr so many our beautiful jewish traditions if they're tied to feelings of stress they're not gonna have a good feeling you know growing yeah. up with all those feelings are going to be tied to to those moments that should be special right and meaningful and inspirational and all those things so it, it was really important to me and i structure my time in a way that it's not stressful you know also like it's just food i'm like it whatever we'll figure it out you know so I, I i tend to be very i am also very quick in the kitchen which obviously helps um and i do have older teenagers who help at home so all those things definitely when my kids were much younger obviously it was harder Oh, yeah. uh, but I'm not changing diapers anymore. Uh, so yeah, so you know, every stage has its, you know, uh, difficulties, but I think it's, uh, you know, planning, having the right attitude, not taking life too seriously, you know? I love it. Yeah. Now, what's the soundtrack playing when you've got Shabbat getting ready? Sun's going down. What's the music you're playing? I love Jewish music. I was raised on good old school Hasidic music. And for me, like it just speaks to my soul. And it's a great way to like get in the groove of Shabbat coming. <laughs> so yeah, I love like Israeli music and Jewish Hasidic music, all that stuff. But you know, I love Backstreet Boys too. So <laughs> I can get down. Yeah. <laughs> if I even look like I'm going to start a dance move, my kids go into a frozen horror. Uh, <laughs> so we'd have to be careful because I do okay. love some Israeli dancing and that could happen if I do that in our house. I hear, I hear. Um, another question for you is I was born in Israel um, oh, wow. and uh, in Haifa. And lately it's well, kind of been a while happening, but I've seen Israeli food taking on a bit of a trendy status with shakshuka on every brunch menu, yeah. much to my husband and son, one of my son's delight and to my, yeah, you know, not a huge shakshuka fan, but oh, I, love um, I know, I don't know why it's <laughs> a thing and there's something to the, the color. Okay. Um, but what do you think is the next Jewish food or possibly kosher food to go mainstream? Um, it's hard. I mean, uh, who am I to predict that? I, I think that, I think that kosher food is going much more, uh, global uh, as opposed to like, okay, you know, we, we always just had, if you had a restaurant, it was either like, you know, uh, it was, it's Israeli food. Sometimes it, depending where you live, you might have like a Bukhari neighborhood that will have, you know, that style food, Persian food. But now we have like different places. We have a Peruvian Japanese restaurant in the city. There's wow. a Georgian uh, restaurant. Yeah, there's a Georgian restaurant in uh, in Queens. Actually, the chef is coming to our dumpling party 
making tea <laughs> poly, which is uh, which are Georgian dumplings. Yes, what? which are amazing because they have like a soup inside the dumpling. Oh, it's I really love cool. dumpling. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like you are you, which is amazing because I think that was missing in the in the kosher culinary world. You know, having to experience different types of cuisine. So. Yeah, I see global ingredients and and cuisines being much more available. I love that. Now, yeah. my favorite spice is za'atar. Um, oh, I, I literally could have it on everything. I mean, it's like, why not? Za'atar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what's your favorite use of za'atar or your favorite recipe that uses za'atar, which I know you have some probably in both uh, yeah. your cookbooks. Well, my first cookbook, Millennial Kosher, has an, an amazing uh, honey roasted za'atar chicken with dried fruit and red wine. And people make it always for like Rosh Hashanah dinner. It's a very, very popular recipe. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. um, but like my favorite, I mean, I, I literally put za'atar also on so many things. Love um, I love this. I do a whole roasted cauliflower with za'atar and lemon zest and garlic and honey and sumac that I rub all over the cauliflower. Uh, and then you finish it with some tahini. It's amazing. Um, so I love that. I, I mean, I, I, so many things, I don't know. Could put, like you said, you could put za'atar and cardboard. It will be delicious. <laughs> I literally agree. I, and I can smell it from like a thousand, I'm like a super sniffer. I can smell it from like a thousand miles away. Yes. I can hear Hebrew from a thousand miles away and smell za'atar from like, this is, I don't think, you know, a superpower, but it's just what it is. But my, um, my favorite spice of all time is Hawaii. -ish. It's a Yemenite okay. spice one. Okay. So that one, like they're, they have a savory one and a sweet one. So it's a Hawaii for soup and Hawaii for coffee. I actually started selling my own, uh, my own blends uh, with the release of the book. So but they're, yeah, so they're like, I like otherworldly, like they, they just take you to another, the smell is incredible. So okay. I have a Yemenite soup, sheep pan chicken in totally kosher that uses the, the uh, savory Hawaii. And then I have these ginger snap, Hawaii's ginger snap cookies, which use the Hawaii's for coffee. Oh, I am I on that. I know you have a shop section on your blog. Yeah. Is that where you would find that? Um, yes, I, yes, you can also on my Instagram in my, uh, my link and profile link. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Amazing. If I can learn to pronounce it, that will be even better. Hawash. Hawaii. 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 Yeah. Okay. Amazing. That's another yes. thing I remember my aunt in Israel, Dory will be very happy that all of her cooking has stuck with me, but I remember she made Yemenite bread and it like took the entire table and it was. Kubane. That's what it's called. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Um, Okay, it's almost time for um, Q and A. So get your last questions in if anyone has them. I know we have a couple waiting in the wings. Um, my last question before we go to Q and A for you is: um, I know I read on your busy in Brooklyn blog that you never thought you'd write another cookbook. So <laughs> I'm curious, what changed? What inspired cookbook number two? Well, my first cookbook was actually published uh, by a, uh, a very large mainstream Jewish publisher. And, uh, you know, my book was available in every Judaica store around the world, but not really mainstream bookstores. Um, and for my second book, I was actually approached by Clarkson and Potter, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And I was like, this is an opportunity to reach a whole new demographic and have my, you know, have my book in Barnes and Nobles, which I always dreamed of. Um, so you know, once that opportunity came my way and they approached me, I was like, I can't say no, this is a dream. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why I went with it. It's amazing. It's, but yeah, it's writing a book is definitely a labor of love and it is very, very labor intensive, especially when you're the food photographer and the recipe developer and, you know, and all those other things. It's, I mean, after my first one, I was like, I'm not, I'm never doing this again, but yeah, I mean, I'm really glad I did. We are really glad you did too. It is, a true gift. And like I said, I felt a pride in Jewish Heritage Month. is just icing on the cake, but I really did feel a pride like about being you. Jewish um, and having this be part of our part of our story. Um, let's go ahead and move over to Q&A and get some um, of the audience's questions answered. Uh, okay. That's all right. Beginners. So Farah has a question for us. What is the best recipe for beginners like myself? Um, so I, I said earlier, I think I think the eggplant carpaccio is like so easy. So I think that if you want to do something that's like show stopping and different with a really wonderful and it does have za'atar on it. Um, 
with uh, you know an explosion of flavors and colors, and you definitely want to go with the jarred, uh, you know, Galil eggplant half. Definitely a great one because you can't mess it up. So recommend it. I love that. Any recipe that comes with a hack, I'm in. I'm here yes. for that. <laughs> All right. Who's next? Kate. Hello, Kate. Are there any meals or foods that you buy processed when you're in a pinch for cooking a meal? Uh, definitely. Um, in general, definitely my approach is I like to cook mostly from scratch, but there are, you know, different things that I lean on. Like I'll make a quick shakshuka using marinara sauce as a base and I'll add like cumin to it, uh, a little bit of harissa mixed into the marinara sauce to give it a little bit of that um, Middle Eastern flavor. I'll finish it off with zaatar, of course. Um, I, I'll, I'll do like a quick bolognese also with mar store-bought marinara. I add a splash of wine to it and a bay leaf to kind of deepen the flavor a little bit. And then, you know, just uh, ground uh, up some beef, add the ma already prepared marinara sauce. Um, so marinara is definitely one of those products that I'll lean on a lot you know, just to cut time. And there's lots of great companies that make good ones like Paisana is great um, and doesn't have lots of added sugars and stuff like that. So I, but I'm conscious about reading labels also that if I'm going to buy something processed, you know, you could compare two products that are right next to each other on the shelf and one has, you know, corn syrup or lots of, you know, things that we can't pronounce. And they always say the rule is you should be able to pronounce every ingredient on the label. So, um, yeah, so I'm just conscious about reading labels. You don't have to go crazy with it, but like, yeah. I love that. And I love your question, Kate, because that's exactly the kind of question I would have as well, and I'm sure many of us have. Um, and Hani, it reminds me of, I was watching a video of you. I think you were talking about kosher for Pesach, kosher for Passover um, items, and you were like, this is mustard, this is not mustard. Was that kosher for Passover? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Can you just yeah. tell tell um, our listeners about, I love that. And it reminded me of your reading labels. Um, yeah. Well. No, because, you know, when it comes to Passover, also, th that's another one of the, you know, holidays where everyone has different levels of what they keep and what some people eat see uh, seeds uh, and beans and, and legumes and rice. Some people don't. Right. I, do, I grew up barely eating anything processed at all. So like for the people that don't eat things uh, that have seeds in it, can't eat mustard seed or any kind of seeds. So they sell kosher for Passover mustard, but I would never use that because it's literally made out of you know, food coloring, uh, you know, it, just, it doesn't taste anything like mustard. So I was trying to explain when you want to adapt a recipe from, you know, a year round recipe and make it kosher for Passover, sometimes it's worth doing and sometimes it's not. If you can make the recipe without mustard, then go ahead and do it. If you have to use mustard and you, I would rather not make the recipe than use that stuff. That's just doesn't taste like mustard, you know, whereas if you wanted to make a recipe using soy sauce, you can use coconut aminos, which would be the gluten-free replacement for uh, soy sauce, which is a natural product. So that I would do. Yeah. Oh I mean, I feel like this gets at the heart of why all of the food and beautiful pieces of art that you make are not brown and don't all taste the same also, because you're like, hey, guess what? If the option is to use fake mustard that just happens to be in a yellow container or real mustard, we're going to use real mustard or we're not going to make this dish. And I mean, I think it makes all the difference because to me, it's like many different kinds of food, whether it's, you know, gluten-free or vegan. And it's like the fake chicken wing or thing that's made out of a tofu. What it's yes. just, there's a point where you should just go with what works and not just keep, keep pushing. Um, so I, I love that. And it's also part of why I think, watching you and listening to you makes, it's like, I can feel like I'm a little more savvy in the kitchen and know what's going on just by listening to you talk about your things, which helps it feel so much more accessible, I think, to those of us who might not be the most, you know, um, impressive chefs, shall we say. All right, next question for Hani. Sophia, what inspired you to start your Busy in Brooklyn blog and what keeps you going? Thank you, Sophia. Um, I think that, well, I started it because I, you know, I'd worked outside the home for many years after I had my third child, I was just kind of ready to quit working. Uh, and I needed a way to express myself creatively. Uh, I'm a very creative mind. And I was just like, if I just change diapers all day, I'll 
shoot myself. So I just needed an outlet for myself. So I really, I originally started it kind of just like a hobby. And the tagline back then was cooking, crafting, and coping. And I would do like some recipes, some crafts, and then some articles about my life as a young mom. Um, and then when I started getting so much feedback from people making my recipes and like people started sending me photos of their family sitting around the table and, you know, making my dishes. And I, I realized like the power of food to bring people around the table because I've always kind of been this person that like tried all, all these different hobbies, but like it, for me, it stuck. And my, I like to say my blog just had its boss mitzvah because it turned 12 years old. Um, and awesome. I've never done anything for that long, um, you know, in terms of, you know, a, a hobby, a passion, but like there was just, it was so powerful to see how food can bring us together. And also just the beauty of celebrating our traditions, our beautiful traditions, being Jewish, um, uh, around food and having people, you know, for, I get messages from people like in Zimbabwe making challah for the first time for Shabbat. Like it's really special and it brings us all together in a beautiful way. Love that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's see. It seems we have one last question from listeners. Alex, Khani, do you prefer dairy free cheese on real meat or real cheese on fake meat? Such a good question. I think that is a great question. Personally, I'm not a fan. I feel like no matter how hard you try, you can't really mimic the texture of like the cheese pull situation on like a vegan cheese. You just can't. But whereas now with products like Impossible Beef and Beyond Beef, really, I mean, we're not talking from a healthy perspective because it's not necessarily uh, healthy to buy these plant-based meats, but it really does taste like beef. So like I make smash burgers at home with Impossible Beef, real cheese, uh, my special sauce, which is in the book. It's literally one of my kids' favorite dinners uh, that I make for Meatless Mondays. And I have to remind them because we are Jewish and we do keep kosher. It is not, this is a kosher cheeseburger because it's fake meat. So remember the meat is fake. <laughs> um, yeah, because growing up, who could ever eat a cheeseburger? So. Oh my gosh. And that's a good sign that it must taste so good if you have to actually remind them because yeah. if it wasn't that good, you would be like, as you can see, this yes. is not a real. Oh, it's so burger. good. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of the things like a corn dog, like your, your hacks, I'm all, I'm here for all of it. I am here for all of it. And mazel on the bot or bar mitzvah of your blog. And I can't believe I could say that without <laughs> something on course. I'm kind of proud right now. Um, okay. One last question for you, Hani, is, can you please remind us where we can find your gorgeous book? So Totally Kosher is available wherever books are sold, uh, Barnes and Nobles, your local, you know, bookseller, uh, Amazon, of course, uh, on Penguin Random House's website, uh, you know, really anywhere. So I love it. And, and if you live out of town, like book depository uh, ships all over the, you know, for free all over the world. So I literally been carrying this book around with me, like a bit of a weirdo. I'm like, it is so gorgeous. I could literally Thank just you. look at the picture. So it is a true gift. It makes me proud. I literally feel pride and I'm so happy I had the chance to spend this time with you and share some of your, your wisdom and creativity um with all of us so thank you again so much for joining talks at and thank you to everyone for tuning in and joining us um remember to get connie's book which it sounds like you can get pretty much anywhere which i love um and we'll see you all at the next talks at thanks for having bye. me bye